Imagine walking across a vast plain and seeing something so colossal that it makes an elephant look small. That's Paraceratherium, one of the largest land mammals to ever exist, with a shoulder height of up to 4.8 meters, 16 feet. Despite its overwhelming size, this animal had no horns or armor and was not a fearsome predator. It was simply a gentle plant eating giant. So what allowed a creature weighing up to 20 tons, around 44,092 pounds, to survive and thrive for millions of years? Let's explore the unusual traits that made its success possible. How could a mammal grow bigger than an elephant and still keep itself fed each day? The answer begins in its head. Paraceratherium's skull wasn't just outsized, it was engineered differently from anything alive now. A defining trait was the extremely deep retracted nasal notch. In some species, the notch pulled so far back that it reached the region around the second or third premolar. That skeletal gap strongly suggests the animal carried either a muscular prehensile upper lip or a short trunk, something built to grasp and strip food far above the ground. Paleontologists remain divided on which of these features it actually had. Some describe a tapers trunk as capable of flexing upward, while others favor a long lip, powerful enough to pinch entire branches. Because we only have bone and no preserved soft tissue, both reconstructions remain hypothetical. The skull shape gives clues, but several possibilities fit, which means we can't be dogmatic. What is clear is that whichever structure sat on the front of its face was tuned for efficiency, allowing the animal to funnel vegetation into its massive jaws. Those jaws themselves were unusual. Instead of horns like modern rhinos, Paraceratherium relied on long tusk-like incisors at the front. These were paired with extraordinarily extended jaws that gave leverage to nip shear or bend supple branches overhead. The incisors were separated from the grinding cheek teeth by a wide gap showing a clear division of labor, the front system for grasping and cropping the back for chewing leaves into manageable pulp. Functionally, it occupied an intermediate spot between a tapir's grabbing snout and a giraffe's enormous reach, a high browser that manipulated tree canopies with bone lips and teeth acting in concert. To understand what it ate with that equipment, scientists looked not just at shape, but also at wear patterns and chemistry. Mesoware analysis of Paraceratherium's molars shows rounded edges consistent with browsing habits, not the abrasive grinding of grazers. Stable isotope data points the same way matching a diet of C3 vegetation woodland leaves young shoots and shrubs. That means the animal specialized in softer forest-based plants rather than grasses of the open steppe. Crucially, even though it was among the largest mammals ever known, its teeth were low crowned, making them poorly suited to stripping silica-rich grasses or grit-laden ground cover. Its survival depended on staying tied to tree canopies. This specialization raises a striking problem. Weight estimates for Paraceratherium vary, but most reconstructions place adults in the mid-teens to low 20s of tons based on partial skeletons. A body of that size would have required several hundred kilograms of food daily, yet the very shape of its teeth restricted it to a narrower menu than more general browsers. The solution seems to have been vertical exclusivity. It monopolized food supplies out of the reach of most competitors. By lifting its head and extending its lip or trunk into high tree layers, it tapped a resource zone few animals could touch. Its skull wasn't oversized for show. It was a structural key to unlock a canopy full of energy. The advantage wasn't risk-free. If woodlands thinned or climates shifted toward grasslands, its specialization would have turned into a liability. But as long as tall vegetation remained, this combination of retracted nasal notch incisors and prehensile feeding organ gave Paraceratherium reliable access to leaves no other mammal could claim. The skull was less like a rhino's and more like a precision harvesting tool on a massive frame. Of course, harvesting all that food solved only part of the survival challenge. Once the energy flowed in, the bigger obstacle was structural. How could an animal weighing well over 10 tons, around 22,046 pounds, avoid collapsing under its own bulk? The rest of its body had to bear the constant strain of living as a land-based giant. Carrying a body that ranked among the heaviest in mammalian history demanded an evolution of structure as much as scale. Paraceratherium's frame was built for weight support, first mobility second, and speed not at all. Most credible mass estimates now cluster between 10 and 20 tons, with many favoring the 15 to 20 ton range. Early reconstructions that pushed it well above 20 tons came from oversized skeletal composites and have since been revised downward. 
Even at the lower end, the challenge remains daunting. How do you stop a land animal of that size from collapsing under the straightforward force of gravity? The blueprint nature chosen was Gravi Portal. Instead of flexed spring-like legs, it walked on vertical columns of bone that shuttled weight directly into the ground. This same mechanical principle keeps elephants upright today, though the two giants were not identical in design. Paraceratherium's legs were slightly more elongated and ended in three broad toes. That tripod-like contact spread its load across a wider base, stabilizing the joints and lessening the chance of dangerous twists. Picture a skyscraper resting on massive pillars. Each limb was a living column, braced to carry unimaginable tonnage one step at a time. The engineering extended beyond the legs. The vertebrae of the neck and trunk contained pleurocole-like openings, air-filled hollows carved into the bone. These lightened the skeleton while leaving it strong enough to withstand strain. The effect was similar to sauropod dinosaurs, which managed necks many meters long without snapping. For Paraceratherium, saving even a few kilograms in the vertebrae mattered when multiplied across dozens of bones. Less skeletal weight meant less load pressing down on the pillars below, and more efficiency when lifting an enormous skull several meters around several feet into the canopy. Its limb bones reinforced this strategy further. The shafts were massive cylinders, their rounded geometry distributing mechanical stress evenly in all directions. A thinner or differently shaped design would have been prone to fractures under the constant pounding of multi-ton steps. Instead, each femur reaching nearly five feet around 1.5 meters long acted like industrial grade scaffolding, rigid but durable enough to support both body and movement. Combined with the three-toed stance, the effect was stability over speed, not a sprinter's body, but one optimized to walk long distances without mechanical failure. That brings up an unavoidable question. Why did mammals never reach the truly colossal scales of certain dinosaurs? Dinosaurs benefited from extensive pneumatization throughout the skeleton and a respiratory system with air sacs that shed weight and improved oxygen flow. Mammals had denser bone-heavy muscle and very different lungs. Studies suggest mammals run into hard constraints near 20 tons, governed by the density of their skeleton, the metabolic cost of moving so much tissue, the problem of dissipating heat through relatively small surface areas, and the long gestation times needed to reproduce at such scales. Paraceratherium appears to have nudged right against those limits, stretching mammalian biology to its ceiling. What results is a paradox. Gigantism gave it protection from predators and access to food no other browser could reach, yet the very physics of supporting such a body dictated a life of structural compromise. Imagine a mobile fortress engineered by bone and tendon designed not for agility but for endurance. Each step was the success of natural engineering applied at mammalian maximums. That endurance, however, did not keep Paraceratherium tied to one place. With a body seemingly at the edge of possibility, we might expect immobility or narrow habitat use, yet its fossils tell a different story. Instead of being confined to a single valley or climate, it left traces stretching across nearly the whole of Eurasia. The story of Paraceratherium's success is not just about size, but about movement about a giant that ranged across an entire continent. Its fossils turn up from Pakistan and Kazakhstan through Mongolia and northern China, extending even into parts of Eastern Europe. This distribution is extraordinary for a land mammal of its scale. Recent studies reinforce why such distances were possible in the Oligocene. The Tibetan region was not yet the immense plateau it is today. Instead, lower elevation corridors spread across Central Asia, allowing these animals to move widely without colliding into impassable walls of mountains. What they moved across was not a uniform landscape. The environments available to Paraceratherium formed a patchwork. Sediment and pollen evidence show strips of riverside forest alternating with open woodland dry shrublands and stretches that bordered desert. So rather than a continent blanketed in one ideal habitat, the land was a mosaic of options, each requiring movement to reach. For a browser of immense size, this was crucial. A giant animal with narrow preferences would have been stranded as forests shifted or as seasons dried out local browse. Paraceratherium's flexible diet based on a prehensile lip or trunk and mixed browsing teeth allowed it to handle these differences while continuing to move on when resources thinned. Mobility therefore became one of its major adaptations. Paleontologists infer that animals this large could not survive on a small territory. Instead, they likely maintained home ranges on the order of hundreds to thousands of square kilometers. Such ranges let them track scattered groves of trees across changing seasons and climates. 
Where smaller herbivores might compete within a few valleys, Paraceratherium's strategy was to roam out of competition entirely, sidestepping scarcity by covering distances few mammals could match. The continental geography enabled this dispersal. In the Oligocene, Asia was shaped by great basins and emerging mountain chains, but the barriers were less extreme than what we see now. The Himalayas were still rising and Tibet had not yet become the roof of the world. These conditions created open corridors stretching westward into Europe. Groups of Paraceratherium could follow river valleys, skirt uplands and occupy new territories in a shifting but connected system of lowlands. What looks like an impossible spread on today's map was at the time an achievable expansion across linked environments. Its evolutionary history revealed in part through new fossil evidence mirrors this adaptability. A 2021 discovery of Paraceratherium linksiensa in the Linksia Basin of northwestern China brought forward a nearly complete skull. This specimen showed not just another member of the genus, but hints of a sequence adjustments in jaw length nasal retraction and tooth proportions that may represent gradual changes tailored to the environments encountered during its spread. Gigantic size was not achieved in a single evolutionary leap but was maintained through incremental modifications aligning anatomy with new diets as the animal advanced into different regions. Taken together, these patterns show Paraceratherium as flexible both in body plan and in range. It did not depend on a single kind of habitat, nor was it confined by steep terrain. Its broad browsing abilities, its tolerance for mixed environments, and its capacity for enormous home ranges explain why it succeeded where other heavyweights faltered. The giant did not dominate by standing still. It succeeded by walking across a continent, but mobility had a limit. It only functioned as long as trees and wooded strips remained to refuel the massive bodies moving across those plains. When climates shifted further and woodlands gave way to harsher open landscapes, even a strategy built on movement could not offset the loss. That sets the stage for the deeper puzzle. If size security and a continent wide range were not enough, what forces finally brought down the largest land mammal of all time? For Paraceratherium disappearance came not from a single fatal blow, but from a convergence of pressures acting at the end of the Oligocene. Paleontologists do not agree on one core cause. The most convincing view is that climate change, habitat loss and added ecological stresses all interact to push the species toward extinction. The late Oligocene world was growing harsher for specialized browsers. Global climates cooled, polar ice expanded, and rainfall diminished across wide swathes of Eurasia. Stable isotope signatures and plant fossil records both indicate that tall C3 woodlands, the very ecosystems that sustained Paraceratherium, were contracting. In their place came more open woodlands, shrublands, and the slow spread of grasses. For an animal tied to high foliage, this meant that its primary food source was narrowing. With low crowned molars ill-suited to grass or abrasive ground cover, it could not shift diets as easily as smaller, more generalist feeders. Competition added further strain, though how decisive it was remains debated. Early proboscideans, the stock that would later give rise to elephants, expanded into Eurasia during roughly the same interval. Their teeth were more versatile, able to cope with mixed diets and tougher vegetation. Some researchers propose that these newcomers altered habitats and reshaped browsing niches, possibly displacing or outcompeting Paraceratherium in shrinking woodlands. But other paleontologists point out that direct fossil evidence for Gomphotheres and Paraceratherium living in close proximity is sparse. The idea of competition is plausible, yet it remains speculative and should not be treated as the sole explanation. Predators almost certainly played only a supporting role, but one still worth noting. Large carnivores such as amphicyonids, the so-called bear dogs, and formidable hyenodonts were present in the early Miocene. While a healthy adult Paraceratherium was an unlikely target, juveniles were more vulnerable. The loss of calves, especially when coupled with low reproductive rates and heavy food demands, could have eroded populations already stressed by shrinking habitat. Predation probably did not topple the giants on its own, but it may have applied steady pressure at their margins. The paleoecological evidence leaves a consistent picture of decline tied to the environment. Regions that once supported dense tree canopies have transformed into patchier and more seasonal habitats. Isotopic traces confirm a fallback to vegetation that was less nutritious for a specialist browser, while wear on the teeth of more adaptable contemporaries shows clear adjustments to harder mixed diets. Paraceratherium, lacking the dental flexibility to follow suit, was effectively locked into a narrowing ecological pathway. 
From a biological perspective, gigantism itself imposed strict limits. To keep a body mass of 15 to 20 tons functioning required enormous and consistent food input. Smaller herbivores can survive lean periods by diversifying diets or reproducing quickly when conditions improve. A giant browser had none of these advantages. If the canopy thinned, no energy buffer remained. When ecosystems tipped against them, population collapses could have followed rapidly. Seen this way, extinction was not paradoxical, but predictable. Paraceratherium thrived, while conditions matched its specialization's tall forest reliable foliage and few rivals in its feeding zone. Once those foundations gave way, cooler climate reduced rainfall, new herbivores, and heightened predation, the very adaptations that once ensured dominance turned into constraints. This sets up a final reflection worth considering. The animal that grew larger than any other mammal did not fall to tooth or claw, but to ecological shifts beyond its control. Paraceratherium's tale closes with a lesson about survival itself. Size offered power, but power alone was never enough. Its anatomy, the retracted nasal notch, the long neck and the massive jaws opened a unique feeding niche high in the canopy. Yet those same specializations meant fragility when forests shrank and climates shifted.